All right. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, for about 20 minutes, our first speaker, uh, James Burris, who's the public information officer, a science writer and outreach coordinator for the National Institute of Science Standards and Technologies, is going to be providing um, the arc of some of the story behind the federal labs here in the front range. Uh, and then following that, uh, Brad Feld is going to be responding to some of the uh, discussion and bridging what does that history mean for the startup community here in Boulder and throughout the Front Range. And then Tom Bognan, uh, Carol Taylor, Brad, James, and myself will have a, a moderated discussion. In terms of your neck prevention, um, others who are not speaking, we might want to wheel our chairs around uh, to be able to see Jim's presentation. Um, I, in terms of biographies, I will commend to you the, uh, the brochure handout. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jim. Thanks for being here, Jim. Great. Whoa. Thank you very much. Um, so my, my uh, presentation tonight has some, some good old photos in it um, that we have scanned. And I have just been kind of going through a real treasure trove of old photos and documents that I have on hand at our, um, that I've kind of come into uh, or found recently. And so in the future, there'll be a lot better and a lot more photos. But uh, tonight, we're going to just uh, move ahead. Um, so this is something I, I, I thought of as, as, you know, I was kind of collecting some of the um, images and things. Um, I, I, this, this is definitely got to be a, uh, uh, an issue where um, entrepreneurial spirit and, and venture capital in a lot of ways was provided by, by old time Boulder folks that saw a real opportunity and didn't want it by in, in any stretch wanted to let it get away. Um, so we had, we, there was a lot of things, a perfect storm, if you will, of opportunities happened right around the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. Um, a couple things that, that I don't, that nobody really talks about. Um, there was this issue with the Cold War. They, you know, the Russians are going to bomb us. We can't put all of our eggs in one basket. We've got to decentralize. There was actually a secret uh, a memorandum and, and directive from President Truman before he left office saying we will not build any more major federal government facilities in the Washington, D.C. limits or District of Columbia or in, the, in that general area. Um, that, coupled with the fact that they'd already had appropriations and, and approval for four and a half million dollars in, in new construction on existing um, uh, Department of Commerce and, and National Bureau of Standards land in Washington, D.C. and just outside of Washington, D.C. for a radio, uh, a radio lab, um, immediately the scramble was on, where are we going to build this? We can't do this here. Um, they also realized that Washington, D.C., a growing metropolis, really needed to be a radio quiet zone to do the kind of research that they needed to do. So they started looking around. Quickly, um, a couple places kind of uh, floated to the top. Um, Palo Alto, California, Stanford University, um, they wanted to have uh, this, this new lab, this outpost lab, so to speak, um, located in, a, uh, in, in, a, in a, a location where not only a radio quiet zone, but near a university where they could tap into that young kind of fresh minds of, of people studying new technologies and bringing new thought processes to existing issues and problems and the discoveries of the day. Um, the, the, the locations, the Palo Alto location and also at the uh, University of Virginia in, um, in uh, Charlottesville, um, those locations were kind of politically quickly came to the top. But a couple, of, a, a very unique kind of uh, occurrence happened. Um, in June of 1949, up at Echo Lake Cosmic Ray, the Echo Lake Cosmic Ray Symposium was underway just outside of Idaho Springs near Mount Evans. And at that symposium, there was the NBS director, Dr. Edward U. Condon, who was a longtime director and really kind of forced, was involved with a lot of different NIST um, expansions and, and growth. Um, he met Dr. Walter War or Roberts at this symposium. And at the time, Dr. Roberts was the superintendent of the University of Colorado's High Altitude Observatory at Climax Springs. And Dr. Condon was, you know, they became quick friends. Um, he was, Dr. Condon discussed 
the fact that you know we've got to find a, a, we need a new lab. Here's kind of what we're looking for: radio quiet zone. It can't be in Washington, you know. And we're you know we we're looking around for a place to put this. And and <laughs> Dr. Roberts said, "Oh, I know exactly where you should put this." And so he brought him down to Boulder, gave him a tour of the campus here. And I don't know if you can imagine, you know, we're in a nice big valley bowl. We haven't had, you know, this is like late 40s, so there's not a lot of radio propagation spilling over from Denver. So we have a radio quiet zone here at the time. Um, and, and, you know, Dr. Dr. Condon just fell in, fell in love with the place. Um, ended up going back, to, back east to Washington, gathering a bunch of his folks later that summer, and came out here for the 4th of July, like two and a half weeks later. So definitely a, a quick, uh, a, a Niwot curse was implanted. Um, if you will, into, into the folks there. Everybody there loved it. But the, but the appropriations that they had, $4.5 million, was for construction of a lab. That was not for purchase of land. And that money, they, to make it, how do, you, how do you build a lab if you don't have a place to put it? Um, so the, 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 not, the, the, not the city of Boulder, but the Boulder Chamber of Commerce got together, put together a, a a funding committee to find a way to, to raise money to purchase land for this lab. And, you know, the, 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 the folks involved with that is really, you know, a who's who, a who's who of, of early Boulder. Boulder Chamber of Commerce, principally Boulder businessman James J. Yeager, who is the chamber and chamber president Virgil H. Reynolds, junior past president John F. Allardyce, and the Boulder Elks Lodge. The Boulder Elks Lodge, Lodge raised $10,000 out of the little over $90,000 that was raised in two weeks. And back in 1949, 50, it's a lot of money really fast. Um, that they, they only, they, they thought the property that they were looking at was going to sell for about $70,000. It's 217 acres that you see here. There's a fence post. That's right along what used to be Marshall Road later paved and called Broadway. Um, and you can see back in the very distance, that's, that's the, uh, the, the cemetery um, that, that's located uh, in the, on the east of, of our, on the western, Green Mountain Cemetery. That's right. Thank you. Um, and so there you have it. Um, we, they, the purchase was made, $63,000, um, sold to the U.S. government for a dollar. They took the leftover money and bought a chunk of land out on Arapaho that you might know as, as the Ball Brothers, uh, uh, the Ball Brothers Research Corporation, um, later Ball Aerospace. And so that money was, I would say, probably some of the best money that, that, in, that independent private citizens have ever spent in, in Boulder, Colorado, as far as high tech and startups go. Um, we had the first, first sitting president to ever visit the city of Boulder, Dwight Eisenhower, came out to dedicate the, the site in, in, uh, on September 14th, 1954. So we just celebrated our 60th anniversary last year. Um, and they said 10,000 people showed up here for the, for the dedication. And at the time, the, the population of the city of Boulder was a little over 20,000. So a little over half, maybe, of the, of the people that lived here showed up to, to see President Eisenhower give what, by all accounts, was, and, and the recording kind of backs this up, a 20-minute talk, presentation, remarks. Thanks. Glad to be here. Good to see Joe and Tom. And, and, uh, and so here we go. He, he literally pushed a button that had an electrical uh, a motor attached to a little device that flipped up and, and exposed the, the NIST Boulder Labs nameplate, metal nameplate on the building. So very high tech at the time, you know, you push the button, ooh, it's, there's, there's a little motor involved. But huge crowd of people. This I had to scan. This is, this is looking down from Kohler Mesa down the boomerang, if you've ever hiked up there. Um, you're looking down into the NIST lot. You can see the, the roof of the building. Let's see if I have this. The, Roof of the building here is what what was uh, um, part of the hydrogen uh, the the hydrogen gas or hydro liquid hydrogen facility 
that was built here before they even started construction on the NIST Boulder Labs, the building one, the, the radio building that they, they named it. Um, that building was used and um, was making cracked hydrogen and, um, and byproducts of liquid hydrogen for use in the first hydrogen bomb that was tested. And they thought, we're going to need a lot of this stuff. Um, they had this federal lab. We'll put it here. This is the, this is the only hydrogen uh, manufacturing facility west of the Mississippi. And after the first test, they realized, oh, we don't need that much hydrogen to do this. We can just use a little bit. And so this facility immediately kind of just kind of fell off the, the, uh, the, the edge of, 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 of necessity. But the, the cryogenic uh, elements of this um, did, did perpetuate and are part of, a, of an area of research at our Boulder Labs. Um, the other thing that's kind of fun is, see these little rooftops here? This is a naked neighborhood that ends right about Ash Street. And that's, that's the beginnings of Martin Acres with not a tree in sight. And, uh, and so that's kind of our bedroom community in a lot of ways for folks at NIST. Um, in addition, after the, after the building one was, was built, we had a, uh, another construction project in the early 60s. Um, after we adopted use, or, or when we were in the process of, of adopting and, and coming up with an atomic clock and a free, uh, as a frequency standard, um, we needed a way to propagate that information to the general public, get it out. It's, you know, you can have a great, uh, accurate clock, but if nobody can share that time and use it, it's pretty much worthless. So this radio station was, was found uh, or built in another radio quiet zone north of here outside of Fort Collins. And this radio station is on about 400 acres. These, these antennas that you see here, um, these antennas are 400 foot tall antennas. This building right here is a four story building. And the, uh, the, the broadcast area is, and you can see the, the guy wires that make the mesh of the, of the antenna. Um, and this currently is our, is our current um, radio station that we use, and it broadcasts signals at 5, 10, 15, 20, and 60 megahertz, 24 hours a day. And that signal is what you use to uh, have your wall clocks, the atomic, or it says atomic time clocks that are set by radio, by our radio signal. Um, and wristwatches, and now with the advent of a new propagation um, tool, the phase modulation of our signal that we started about a year, a little over, about a year and a half ago, um, that signal is now much more robust. We got about a 30 decibel gain in signal strength, and uh, you'll be seeing um, those, those uh, chip receiver devices and a lot more uh, appliances and things like that because the signal is now strong enough to penetrate things like refrigerators, microwave ovens, um, traffic signal control boxes. So synchronization is going to be, become an even bigger part of our daily lives. Um, other, other, uh, other elements of uh, NIST in our research here out of our Boulder Labs. Um, this is the, 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 the code, the, the, um, the television code for you know, the video and then some of the audio. And in doing some research on television signals, they found that we were, there's a big chunk of the bandwidth that was not getting used by, you know, in the different frequency bands for the different television stations. So one of our folks at, at NIST said, well, you know, that's, that's a, you put a lot of information in that. Um, let's, let's see about, you know, putting a, a text box across the bottom of the, of the picture and um, be able to put a transcript up there of what, whatever news people are, are reading and, and, and talking about on TV. Closed captioning was born at NIST in Boulder, Colorado. And we won an Emmy Award. <laughs> not, because, not because we can act, but because we have really smart people. So, um, so we have, you know, we have, uh, actually the Emmy Award was the first one, and that thing, I think kind of, kind of broke the barrier and, and then many Nobel Prizes followed after that. Um, <laughs> you know, you start small, you kind of get bigger, right? Um, and uh, the, um, so, Time. Time is one of the main things that, that we have uh, is our, been our stock and trade at NIST over the years. Um, time and frequency. Um, the the advent of the atomic clock has enabled so much, so much, out, and that and, and it's all originated here in Boulder. Um, our GPS system is was kind of launched out of Boulder and and the use of and the miniaturization of atomic clocks, making them robust, putting them on satellites, and then beaming that signal down being able to triangulate your position anywhere on Earth. Um, I mean, 
I don't know if you can't if you can't find your 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 uh, you know the closest Walgreens in a foreign city because you you know put that address into your GPS system. You know, I'd, most people would be lost, but that's, that's a, a NIST device. But they originated with our Atomic Fox. Now, this is NBS-4. Um, it was our Atomic Fox in 1970. It's about a little over a meter long, and it wasn't as accurate as they wanted it to be. And they said, well, we're not getting enough signal. We need, we need to be able to measure these cesium atoms as they travel through a microwave cavity. We need to be able to measure them for a little bit longer. So, you know, usually something longer, bigger, that's going to be better. So they made a longer, bigger clock. And in fact, longer and bigger was not better because the cesium atoms, as they fly down the, the vacuum tube in the picture here, they would fall out of the cesium beam because of gravity. So this was too much. You know, it's kind of like the, 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 uh, the, the Goldilocks and the three atomic clocks. The, um, you know, first one's too short, next one's too long, and now we have the kind of in-between. It's a little longer, but not too long, much better. And this, is, this was our standard for, for almost 20, a little over 20 years um, in NIST 7. Um, and NIST 7 was uh, in, the, in the late 90s. We started, we started to win, atomic, or win some Nobel Prizes. Um, the, the research going on at NIST has always been it's a, the environment has been one of real innovation and freedom of, of not having to a deadline or something that you have to go and produce. I don't have to have a result. I just need to find out more. And what can I do to make our measurement of whatever we're doing, whether it's the speed of light or time, more accurate and more precise? And so that's been driving our researchers for years. And, um, as we, as we found new ways to make pieces of that process better, um, the Nobel Prizes started to come. One, the, the, uh, uh, one of the first ones in 1997 was uh, Bill Phillips, who uh, took a technology that actually Dave Wineland had been working on for many years, using lasers to cool atoms um, and cool them to almost absolute zero. He, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for that. He was a researcher back in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, there are people who feel like, well, you know, that kind of should be shared with Boulder. That's beside the point. It's water under the bridge at, at, at this point. Um, even before that, we were using our atomic clock to measure the speed of light. And once we did, Jan Hall measured the speed of light um, using, uh, using lasers, and he did a lot of frequency comb um, research in, the, in an old mine shaft up the canyon. And... That research got him the Nobel Prize, and he, and in fact, because he was able to measure the speed of light so accurately, he changed how we measure distance. A meter is no longer a chunk of metal sitting in the National Academies of Science in Paris, France. It is now, the, the, a meter is defined as the distance a krypton laser travels in a vacuum in 2.9986 nanoseconds, I believe. So, so what does that do? I mean, so, so what? I mean, it's a standard. It's like, okay, so why, why does that matter to us? It changes a lot because now you don't see, you see, you see surveyors. They're out there. A survey crew now has a tripod and another guy or girl standing across the way with a reflector on a pole. That tripod has a little plastic white mushroom on the top of it, and that basically is a GPS locator. It tells you exactly where you are. It tells you exactly what time it is, and it tells you exactly how far away that person's standing because it's bouncing a laser from their reflector back to you. So things, just something as simple as surveying um, really became much more accurate because of accurate timekeeping. Um, cooling those lasers, cooling atoms with lasers were incorporated into this, our F1 fountain clock. It is um, one of our two primary standards for frequency right now. And... Um, you know, this, we've really kind of hit the limit on what we can do with, with uh, cesium and, and cooling them down and cooling the atoms down and measuring them in, at uh, microwave frequencies. This is accurate. This, this clock is accurate to parts in 10 to the minus 16. What does that mean? That means if we left this clock to run continuously, it wouldn't gain or lose more than a second in about 100 million years. If you, if our F2 clock is, has, that, has accuracy of a second in about 300 million years, and they don't know if they're going to get much better than that. But where we are getting better is instead of in the microwave frequencies, we're using optical clocks. And those out of the box, we're getting accuracies in 10 to the minus 18. 
So that's about one second every 15 billion years. And things, things, things start to look different when you're able to measure things that precisely. And that's what NIST has been really good at. We, we can now see things like gravitational fields. We can see, um, you, can, you can measure changes in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Earth's crust, um, all sorts of things like that that uh, were not possible before. A um, couple other things, so big, big to small. Um, we have clean rooms at NIST. They're not user facilities, but they are used by various educational institutions and other companies and corporations that do research with us. About 60% of all the research at NIST in some way goes through our clean rooms. Um, we have all manner of, of deposition and lithographic uh, 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 machines that are able to make chips using various kinds of metals, not just your standard silicone and, and gold and copper. Um, this is a chip scale atomic clock. This is blown up. That little post is about the size of a grain of rice. It operates on a single AA battery. Um, John Kitchen came up this, with this about 12, 14 years ago. It, uh, it has everything you need for an atomic clock. It has a vacuum. It has cesium atoms. It has a microwave uh, detector and, and a laser in it. And this isn't as accurate as our atomic clock. It's about accurate to a part in 10 to the minus 9. But that's about the accuracy of the clocks that are in our GPS system flying around the Earth. Um, what can you do with something like this? Well, you want driverless cars? You add this, you add a chip scale atomic clock to your handheld GPS or your onboard GPS, and instead of the plus or minus a meter of resolution of location on the fly by just a single GPS um, satellite coming down and you're taking you know, your location from that, you add an accurate clock like that in your handheld GPS and you have on the fly resolution of location to plus or minus a millimeter. And I don't know about you, but if I'm riding a bicycle, I don't want to be having some car think he's plus or minus a millimeter as he's passing me down, going down Broadway. Of course you ride down Broadway, don't you? Right? No. Um, but, 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 but plus or minus a millimeter, I'm all, I, I, I can handle that. Um, so these are some of the things that we, that we work on at NIST, and I um, would rather have some questions if people do. But time and frequency is one of our, our big things. We do a lot of, ma of, of materials testing. We have a, a state-of-the-art, one-of-a-kind in the world series of, of imaging, imaging devices in our precision imaging facility, an atom scan microscope, a helium ion microscope, an electron microscope, and a, an atomic or a... Uh, well, I think of the third one. I always miss that one. But those those are devices that we can use and look at different chips and, and, and things that we design for sensing devices. We built sensors and, and um, amplifiers that, that detected background radiation from the Big Bang that you might have read about about a year and a half ago. Um, and we, we do materials testing, everything from characterizing uh, nano nanoparticles, nanotubes, to doing pipeline testing where we take chunks of, of inch-thick pipe and pull it apart to test its, uh, to test its, its uh, strength and, and resilience and, and um, how, it, how it behaves under pressure. We also have a hydrogen test facility. It doesn't sound as bad as it sounds. But um, it, we use, uh, in a hydrogen atmosphere, in a small, um, in a small chamber, we test for uh, embrittlement of different elements of our current infrastructure of pipelines, pumps, and, and, uh, and storage tanks to see if our current infrastructure can be used to move hydrogen-based fuels around, um, around the country, because those are, are on the horizon. Um, a lot of different things. We do MRI, phantom uh, standards development, and telecommunications is a big area of, of NIST research. We just created a new um, telecommunications uh, a division called the Communications Technology lab, and we're, we're in the process of hiring several dozen researchers, engineers, and things like that to kind of roll out FirstNet, which is a, a telecommunications um, uh, uh, network that will benefit first responders in a big emergency, basically piggybacking on existing infrastructure of, uh, of a broadband network and being able to use that to, uh, to, to transmit information, use live video and things like that on an as-needed basis. So that's a lot. But I just hope that uh, any questions? I, 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 I think I'm right at the end of my time. Let's go ahead and reserve the okay. questions. We're going to do audience in a little bit, but I want to give Brad a chance to respond and invite other right. panelists to come up. And Brad, do you want to take the uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brad? Um, so that, every time I, I think of 
NIST or drive-by NIST, I, I think of X-Men, so <laughs> um, you're reinforced my, my X-Men fantasy. Um, so there are a couple of things that jumped out at me as you're talking about that, James, that I thought were, were really powerful in the context of um, startup community and the thesis around how the entrepreneurial landscape in Boulder has developed and um, how that's unfolded over time. Uh, for those of you that don't know the Boulder thesis, uh, which is now being used around the world, it's the thing that Brad heard over and over again in, in Chile about how to build a sustainable startup community in any city. It has four attributes. One is that you have to have a critical mass of entrepreneurs as leaders. You have to take a long-term view, at least 20 years. You have to be inclusive of anyone who wants to engage. And you have to have activities and events that continually engage everybody in the act of entrepreneurship. So, it's a framework that I came up with in 2012 that's, that's expanded. There's a lot of interesting inputs to that um, that are around the ecosystem. And what jumped out at me as I was listening to this talk was that many of the characteristics of NIST and the culture around NIST uh, and the evolution of it over time have a very similar characteristics to the evolution development of startup community. And uh, let me just quickly go through each of them. The, the first is really simple, it's, it's fresh meat. So the biggest value for a university to a startup community is fresh meat. Like every year a bunch of new people show up, <laughs> and four years later some of them leave, but some of them stay. And it's this ability to continually get new people into the system, into your community doing stuff. And if you think of uh, NIST and 1954, was that when yes. Eisenhower dedicated? Mm -hmm. There are 20,000 people in Boulder, right. and there's 100,000 people here today. And some non-trivial percentage of those people are here because of NIST. And so NIST as an attractor of a significant group of people in the 1950s and the 1960s, who, and we'll get to this in a sec, were um, high quality fresh meat, right? I mean, these were, these were smart people, these were people who were, uh, uh, scientists, they were ambitious, um, and the neat thing about them is they bred, right? <laughs> so they had kids, and one of the things, uh, and, and uh, we, we learned, I've learned this from many places, one of the places I've learned this is from um, National Center for Women and Information Technology, which is based here uh, at, out of CU, is that a high impact of children's development as science engineers has to do with their parents' involvement with them when they're in sort of teenage years doing science and engineering activity with them. So the same notion of to build a startup community, you have to engage in the act of entrepreneurship. You, just can't, you can't just talk about it, you can't sit back, you have to do it. The same kind of thing happens here is that many, I would, guess, I have no idea, I have no data on it, but I would guess that a meaningful number relative to the overall population of the kids of people who came here to be part of NIST and work at NIST ended up having more of an interest or bias towards science and technology and research and experimentation than the average. So it plays out over time. And that, you know, data you might have, James, if you do, that's great. If you have contradictory data, that would be interesting, but no, I mean, I think that I think that just the number of PhDs per capita in Boulder pretty much says a lot. Um, I, I don't think that they're all PhDs in the humanities. They're probably no. many, most mostly sciences. But and I did I did I hadn't mentioned yet because I didn't want to go too long over. But um, Jilla is was founded in 1962. It's a joint institute with the University of Colorado, where we kind of embed NIST fellows at uh, at at the university, and that has produced. An immense, immense rewards. I mean, two of our Nobel prizes came from Jilla Fellows, Eric Cornell and, and Jan Hall, and um, and those are those are invaluable. And every year, this is this has my how my job has evolved over the past eight years. Um, in the springtime, I put together a, an open house for prospective PhD candidates at, that are looking at going to CU, and Dave Wineland and uh, some other folks at, at NIST say. You know, can you put together a tour? We'll take them to these labs. All the researchers, the primary researchers, Dave Wineland and, and his crew, are all there for these two Saturdays in, in March and April. And at first, I, I, we had, I think, the first weekend we, that I did this, we had about 20-some-odd people. 
um, for each weekend. Dave Wineland wins the Nobel Prize. We have 45 to 50 on each weekend. And, and these are not just you know people doing a second or third tier look. This is their first visit, and they want to see, you know, we're looking for, for students to do this kind of research in this lab, and that's what our folks roll out to these prospective PhD candidates and say, are you interested in this? I could, I'm, I'm looking for four, you know, four doctor stu doctorate students that would want to work on this, and they literally sign people up that day for people that say, I want to do this, I want to work at NIST with a Nobel Prize winner, and I'm going to see you. And so you get, you know, it's, it's an amazing kind of chicken and the egg issue. So but it's very powerful feedback. But when you said a fresh mind, a fresh meat, it's just so true. You know, because of the new thinking, the new technologies that come, that, that are explored at, in the university level, they come into practice in our labs. And, you know, it, it just is an amazing kind of symbiosis. So the stat, uh, third thing on my list was uh, a stat that you mentioned is, is one that I asserted. I have no idea what the, the data behind it is. So I, I sort of assume if you assert something publicly enough times it becomes true. <laughs> That's what the politicians think. Um, is that uh, uh, Boulder has the highest uh, per capita concentration of PhDs. And that has a bunch of different effects, the attractor effect, which you just talked about. Um, it also is a very interesting uh, cultural phenomenon when it's not just in a university. So you see lots of cities around the country that have heavy concentration of PhDs, but they're all in the university. And so they become a captive of the university, and they don't sort of they don't spill out into the broader community. I think in the context of NIST and the other government labs here, you had a broader uh, community of PhDs and very smart people who are interacting with each other in different contexts, and that's actually quite important over a long period of time in terms of stimulating that kind of culture and norm in the community. Um, the next is density, which is. Uh, maybe a loaded word uh, in our in Boulder right now in terms of uh, uh, growth and development, uh, but is philosophically incredibly important um, in any sort of community development, which is that and it, it comes from uh, Richard Florida's Creative Commons work, uh, sorry, uh, Creative Class work and uh, his book uh, Rise of the Creative Class in early 1990s is that you need to have this density of creative smart people across different dimensions that are constantly bumping into each other. And the fact that they're bumping into each other through work, uh, through uh, the university government interaction, through companies that are getting created, through people who live next to each other, through dinner, walking up and down Pearl Street, all those random collisions really matter. The random collisions here over 70 years um, is accelerated by two more generations. Right? So the kids of the people that came and then their kids are part of these random collisions as they start to get together. And if those of you that have kids who are teenagers right now, if you think about who their friends are and who their friends' parents are, if you live in Boulder, the quality of those interactions surpri are surprising relative to many other places because of this density uh, of interesting, creative, smart people. Um, second to last comment I make is how many of you have worked in uh, a research lab, uh, either a government research lab or a university research lab? Good bunch. Nice. So the culture, the lab culture, is a unique culture relative to many other organizations. A lab tends to be very different culturally than a company. And that is a much more sort of naturally collaborative environment there's egos, and there's hierarchy, and there's bureaucracy, and all the normal stuff that comes with trying to organize, especially in the 1950s and 60s as you're trying to scale up. But you have much more of a learning, research, curiosity, investigative approach. And it's one of the things that's very magical about some of the corporate research labs like GE's uh, and Bell Labs in the 1960s and 1970s that have subsequently been completely lost um, uh, in, in contemporary uh, uh, industry. That cultural, those cultural norms of collaboration are exactly the same cultural norms that are needed in a startup community. So if you think about the Boulder startup community, it's an extremely collaborative uh, community. Yeah, there's some people that dislike each other and there's some fights and arguments and some companies uh, uh, intersect or uh, compete with each other every now and then. But generally speaking, people are very collaborative. They want more people to figure things out and to win 
versus playing this constant zero-sum game. And that's very much the nature of a lab culture. And I, I hadn't ever really thought about that as a basis for the culture that evolved in Boulder uh, around the startup scene, but I think that actually had a much more significant impact on the nature of collaboration than a university, because universities within a lab, they tend to be like that. Right. But across the university, they tend to be very much fiefdoms. Whereas in something like NIST, even though there's multiple research projects, if it behaves like most labs that I know at that scale, it's a fair amount of pride and collaboration across the whole lab, even though people are working on different things. That's true. I mean, one, one thing that really that has struck me recently at NIST, and this is within the past year to two years, um, is there's there's almost an abandonment of the siloing of, of, of uh, disciplines. Um, a, a great example of that is we just created a new a new group to study laser welding, and the the you have chemists, engineers, and physicists all kind of noodling about how do we measure the laser power in a 10 kilowatt laser um, as it's welding. How do you do that? And they've taken off the shelf scale that has three, four digits of, uh, of accuracy, turn it on its side, it's able to turn on its side, bounce the laser off of this onto whatever material, material you're welding, and it actually exerts a force, a pressure that can be measured, and you can adjust, make adjustments on that as you're welding. Um, I mean, those types of things that would never maybe come out in a, you know, just a physicist working with a laser. You get the engineers going with the chemists and you're, you're studying the change in the, in, the, in, the, in the viscous metal as it melts and, and, and then rehardens into a weld. I mean, all those things kind of come into play and, you know, it's, it's amazing to see how that's starting to kind of just feed on itself. I mean, you know, more people have an idea they say, well, what about this? What about that? And, and it's, and it's, not, it's no longer just physics, no longer just chemistry. It's no longer just engineering. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that in the years ahead because there's, there's just so much overlap in, in, in various technologies and approaches. It's, it's really amazing. And it's, I think people involved are really excited, too. You can, you can definitely feel an energy about it. Cool. Yeah. Brad, did I hear second to last point? You got one more. It was really culture and then this notion of collaboration. I, I think that I'll, I'll end with that. I think that's a great place to say it. Round of applause. That was great. Thank you. All right. So um, I want to draw in Tom and Carol. Uh, Tom, you've got a, you're kind of a two for one in terms of federal lab perspectives. You're with NOAA uh, before UCAR and then you're president of UCAR. Um, your prism on either the historic pieces, some of which James addressed, uh, and some of the connections to commercialization and the startup community. Uh, let's start there, and then we'll talk to Carol in a moment. Yeah. Boulder has always been, I think, an incredibly unique place for technology and science. And the uh, centerfold that you pointed out really shows that accretion, so to speak, of uh, people that have come here over the years. I think what makes it, to my way of thinking, um, incredibly entrepreneurial um, is this turnover that we have of people who come through Boulder. Uh, people are drawn here from all over the world um, to spend time at our laboratories, at our universities, at our startups, uh, at the various institutions that are here. And being very intelligent, uh, being very entrepreneurial and enterprising individuals, um, they often bring with them significant others who are no less enterprising and industrial and wanting to do things. Perhaps not in the sciences necessarily, but still incredibly accomplished people. And I think that uh, that tendency we have for amazing individuals to come through here on a regular basis is what has led to this model being, first of all, sustainable, um, and secondly, it allowing to move out into the entrepreneurial world where we can take some of these ideas and create ways that the private sector can take those ideas and make useful things out of them that others can work with. And so now we have a really amazing symbiosis between the basic research, the applied research, and then the research that takes that and makes each and, one, each and every one of our lives better 
as a result of that. And, and I think that's what sets Boulder apart. Plus one more thing, the weather in the mountains. <laughs> you could have tried setting this whole thing up in Buffalo, New York, where I grew up. And in fact, <laughs> Buffalo used to be a big city for um, optics, just like Rochester. But there's not much there today because the other things that people appreciate is what do they do in their spare time when they're not solving those problems or getting right. one part in 10 to the 19. Right. There's an amazing environment here. And I think that combination of environment um, on the physical side and environment on the intellectual side has been the reason why everyone on the planet knows about this town in some way, shape, or form. From Chile to China to India, um, Boulder is something that people um, really think about. And when they come here, they treasure their times here. Carol, let me loop in um, Carol Taylor, who is the Associate Director of the Boulder History Museum. Uh, two questions. You can take the one that you think is more interesting or, or answer both if you want. Um, one is, how does this fit into the arc of the Boulder story for you? Are there other parts that you feel like additional context would be uh, relevant and interesting? And second, um, we've got a generation of people who helped build the federal labs here who are aging. Um, what's being done to capture some of these stories? And uh, in your ideal world, what would that look like from a making sure that we, we don't let this history get away perspective? Oh, that brings up a nice opportunity for a plug for our new museum. We're building the Museum of Boulder, which is certainly going to have a lot of the science history. It's become such a huge part of our town. But um, to get back to the first part, um, I, I think when you're talking about fresh meat, there really wasn't fresh meat here. It certainly um, sounded like or, a fraternity party here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the science department, it was really not um, a well-known physics department like we know today. So it really was quite a coup for Boulder to get this because they did want to have um, a labor force for the National Bureau of Standards, and we didn't really have that. Um, so all of the scientists that came in came really from out of town. Um, and it really was an amazing group effort. One of those kinds of group efforts that I think happen a lot in Boulder that were outside of the city government, um, another organization taking the lead. And I have this wonderful document here that says, um, it's a list of people who gave um, a quarter of an acre or more toward this effort, and it's an amazing list that includes the Associated Students of the University of Colorado, uh, Bergheim's Clothing, Boulder, Colorado Sanitarium, <laughs> Tulagi, Stars Clothing, Adolf Kors, Ideal Market. I mean, it really shows you that everybody got involved in this effort, even though it wasn't a science community, but they knew that this was going to be something that would really be wonderful for the town. And it was also just um, purely economics. Um, there was not a, a huge amount of industry in Boulder at that time. Still, up through the 40s, the main economic activities were mining and agriculture. And of course, there were lots of small businesses, but there were two small manufacturing companies, Western Cutlery and Crockett's Bit and Spur. So that's the kind of town that this organization came into and really changed changed the shape of it and, and the makeup. Um, but purely from an economic standpoint, this was really important for Boulder. And just a couple of years um, after, so this announcement was in 50. In 51, the Atomic Energy Commission announced their top secret plant that they were going to build outside of Boulder. And people in Boulder were rejoicing because these were going to be good government jobs. And um, the comments in the newspaper were like, Finally, our young men won't have to leave Boulder to get a good job. So um, a lot of this was just basic economics. Can I, can I add one, one thing to that? I, I, I love this, this list. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, uh, my final point, which I, I decided to punt on, um, <laughs> is this list, which is the notion of a culture of inclusiveness. Um, this is the third principle of the Boulder thesis, this notion that if you want to have a successful startup community that's long-lasting, it has to be inclusive of anyone who wants to engage at any level. And if you think about what 
this is an example of in 1950 was a city uh, who was inclusive of people who did not live in the city and wanted them to come be part mm -hmm. of the city to build a future innovative city, not just for them, but for their kids as well. And that philosophy is one that I think in many ways is at the core of many of the things that have caused Boulder to be incredibly vibrant uh, today. It's certainly at the core when you look across the world at startup communities, this notion of inclusiveness, and not just only of the people who have come to your town, but also the people who have been here for a while and have left, because they have a linkage for your town to wherever they go to. So this, this philosophy and idea is so incredibly important. And it's interesting to think about it contemporaneously now. We have a lot of our own struggles in Boulder around should there be growth or no growth? Should we let more people into Boulder or should we not let more people into Boulder? And this notion, if you look forward for many, many years, independent of size and scale is a vibrancy of new ideas and of being inclusive of new people and ideas that want to be part of your com you know, our community mm -hmm. and build on it. And the notion that ideal market, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which I'm sure most people in this room have shopped at, uh, me included, you know, contributed to this project is awesome. But, awesome. you know, Brad, I think it was an interesting moment in time, and it's something that we could contrast to today. In the 1950s, just after the war, science and scientists had a standing in our society that was in some sense unprecedented. Um, we had come out of an absolutely horrible world war where it was clear that technology, technology, radar, proximity fuse, atomic bomb, you go down that list, was the difference. It was the thing that made a difference. And I think you look at um, how people like Truman, um, Eisenhower had science advisors with them. And what was Boulder reaching out for? Science, right? It was reaching out for this group of individuals, these people who had in some sense delivered our society, so to speak, from um, serious issues with this hope that more was to come. Contrasted to today, I think it's interesting what is the standing of scientists today um, in our nation? It's quite different, isn't it? It's quite different if you think about Washington's approach to the National Science Foundation, that every grant should now have something where the director of the NSF explains why this is a useful use of taxpayers' money. Right? We've come to, I think, a new place in time and part of what is interesting about Boulder's science scene today is that we are living with this difference, and we are struggling sometimes with this difference. So Carol is bringing an unusual politeness, indicating she's not been around Silicon Flatirons long enough. You just tackle somebody when you want to talk. You go ahead, Carol. No, I just want Tom go, to. Carol, I'm next. Okay, you're next. Um, Tom's got a great story about how. Um, President Stearns, President Stearns of the University of Colorado, got involved in what he saw. Yes. So tell that story. Yes. Uh, so during the war, um, Robert L. Stearns, who was the president of the University of Colorado, after George Norlin, who has that famous quote on the library that I love, who knows only their own generation remains always a child. I should, uh, I should start tonight's conversation with that, that actually. That's great. That We're going to do this again other. tomorrow night. I'm going to start with that one. Okay. Um, that's good. Stearns was a businessman from the 16th Street Mall down in Denver. And I think in many ways he often felt very overshadowed in some sense by Norlin, who was a giant, an intellectual giant. Um, Stearns was working during the war um, for the Department of Defense, the, the War Department. And what he noticed very clearly was that the scientists that were going to work on the atomic bomb projects and things like that, they did not come from the University of Colorado. Um, Colorado did not play a large part in the defense buildup, the code breaking, the radar, the proximity fuses, not there. And so he felt that to bring the, organ the university forward, he needed to try to gain um, some entree into that area. And it really is the beginning with Walter Orr Roberts and the organization with Harvard, where Harvard was looking for a university to partner with in the West because its station was up in the mountains here. 
and Stearns was a strong believer in that. There are some wonderful statistics about how by the time we got into the 50s, there was a million dollars a year coming in to research from the federal government to the University of Colorado in the 50s, that it was the 12th most important school in terms of outside federal funding. And this was Stern's, I think, real um, view. Maybe he wouldn't have put it in your terms, uh, but he saw that something was missing here, and he worked to make it happen. I, I think it's really powerful. I think the, the, the I'm going to calibrate or modify the linkage between 1950 and today uh, around the importance in our society of science. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a slightly different word that wasn't being used in the 1950s, but I think if we, if we think about science and research and R&D, especially government-funded R&D in the 1950s and 1960s, right, the internet came out of HARPA uh, and then subsequently DARPA, government-funded activity. Today, in 2015, the, the language is much less around research and development and science, and it's around innovation. And the notion of the importance of innovation, which is a superset of a bunch of different things, including government research, corporate research, and entrepreneurship, where much of the innovation comes out of entrepreneurial activity that are private sector uh, building on, in many cases, fundamental research. Sometimes it's building on government research. Sometimes it's building on university research. Oftentimes it's building on the shoulders of things that have already been created, and sometimes it's completely new innovation that comes from nowhere. This notion of innovation, uh, I think in 2015, especially six or seven years after, you know, the, uh, I don't know whether we call it the global financial crisis or the Great Recession anymore, but, but this notion somehow that big companies and government had it under control. Uh, and then we hit this moment in time where clearly they didn't. And if you look forward, I think over the next 20 to 30 years, there's still an importance of government research. There's still an importance, government-funded research, there's still an importance of university research. But there is an increasing and accelerating importance in the vector of innovation around entrepreneurship and new company creation around this technology. And it's not just building application.com, but the fundamental cultural norms around so I, I actually think that it's not that there's a lesser, greater importance in society. I think there's an evolutionary shift of how it's talked about and what resources are funding it, right? Is the US government and um, the NSF a more important re uh, in, in, uh, fundamental researcher for uh, electronic cars than Google, Apple, and Tesla? And I'd suggest that the money that Google, Apple, and Tesla are putting into research, for, and Uber and others are putting into research for electronic cars, are much more important than anything that's coming out of government-funded research or large incumbent car companies. Those companies wouldn't exist without that vector of innovation. So it sort of builds on itself in a nice way. And, and you know, I don't know what the language will be 20 years from now. But I think as a society, we have to continue to play with that arc and I think Boulder is just, I think what's happening in Boulder today is actually an extension of that arc over the last 60 or 70 years. It's not a dislocation where it's a fundamentally different place. I'm gonna make a speech in search of a question. And after that, we'll interleave audience questions here uh, for the re remainder of our half hour. But um, underscoring the point that Carol made, and I did not know the Stearns role. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, it helps you appreciate how extraordinary it is that we landed that first lab circa shortly after 1950, uh, insofar as you've got the first radio war in World War II. Frederick Terman, who's running the, what was then the Harvard Radio Lab, uh, which really helps play a critical role in World War II, he moves to Stanford, yeah. and we beat Stanford. Well, that, that is really remarkable. I didn't know the, the role of Stearns. And going back to that list, and this is the part that's going to finally find a question here, um, <laughs> which is, it was not just one or two leaders in the community that cut this check. It was average individuals who were putting up $100. And one of the sub-stories to this is the chamber had it the committee, large. and there was a subcommittee that was led by the former football coach. Right. Former football coach of CU, and he goes out in the community, presses the flesh, 
and this thing is done in two weeks with average individuals um, and truly an act of prescient collective action. My question is, um, as you look back, what other collective action stories related to the labs or the startup community are underappreciated? And looking out over the next five or 10 years, what's out there that would be interesting to consider that no one entity is likely to do, but it's gonna take some collective action, not unlike what we saw before? To jump off. So I, okay, so I, I was thinking about this when Carol was talking, but I see this as a longer arc, and that is, there was, there was a point in time when we were first becoming a state, and there was a decision, who do we put the prison in Boulder, or do we put the university in Boulder? Or do we put the prison in Canyon City, or do we put the university in Canyon City? And Boulder said, oh, no, 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 give us the university. So obviously somebody has some vision, and that's a <laughs> overused, an overly used term is vision, but you have to have a vision. And then you get a university here, and it's not bad, but it could be better. What do you do to make it better? You bring in a federal lab. And then that lab then goes and creates the only federal um, uh, working relationship with the university through JILA and just takes off and goes ballistic. Um, the thing that for me personally that's just massively frustrating, especially when you're talking about venture capital and startups and innovation, is they haven't done one or two. They Over the years they've done studies and I know that, that uh, the lead school has done you know, their work with collabs and, and looking at economic impacts. But the most recent study that I've seen or heard has every dollar spent at NIST results in something ungodly like $140 of, of benefit and economic growth and development in various you know, in emerging markets, um, better competition, better quality, better, 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 better. Um, now, I don't know about you, but you know, if, if somebody told me, hey, Jim, there's this company called Microsoft, and they're starting up a company, and if you want to invest in this company, put some money in here maybe in 10, 15, 20 years, I don't know, you know. Well, if in hindsight, of course, you'd say, you know, you'd sell your car, your dog, your clothes, and all your, you know, all your mountain bikes, and you would go and put that money into a Microsoft. Well, if you had a federal lab that was generating, you know, return on investment of 140 plus dollars per dollar spent, I don't know, maybe you would find some way to have to, you know, not, not have to beg, borrow, and steal just to stay even on your budgets every year through the, through the federal government. But um, I, can't, I can't be a lobbyist, and I know, if there's, I know I'll be in trouble now if I have people that work with me, but you're, you know, we have a real gem here, and I hope that over the long term that you know, some sanity starts to prevail and we start to put money into the things that make a difference in this. Our, our, our environment here in Boulder with the labs and the university and the startups and the innovation, it makes a difference. Uh, I'd say there's a lot of truth to the statement that the Googles and the Microsofts and um, the foundations are starting to take a much um, larger role again in supporting innovative research. And it's almost like completing the cycle. Before World War II, it was Andrew Carnegie and others of that ilk who supported the science. Um, the federal government largely stayed out of the science support world. And, and so we're kind of coming around back to that model yet again. And, and what's attractive about it is that um, there's a famous quote I love due to Werner von Braun, which is, research is what we're doing when we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> exactly right. So the true. federal government today is so focused on outcomes and outputs. You write a proposal. I'm going to create a perpetual motion machine. You, should, you have to be successful, else you don't get the next grant. Um, and so by looking so close at that goose that's laying the golden egg of research, um, many federal dollars now, and there are exceptions, there are some labs, NIST being one, DARPA being another area where there's still a lot of uh, dollars that go in for um, research that really is not so directed uh, from above, but that direction is what stifles the creativity. That direction is what gets in the way of the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and so it's interesting that we're coming full cycle again, and with Google coming to Boulder, um, with the startups that we had around storage tech and others, 
in the IT industry, you can see us again potentially coming to your question playing a role in that arena as well as the focus of funding shifts. I think, I think both, both of those two things, you know, what James said and what Tom said are complementary. You know, the frustration of uh, I'm now in a world in 2015 in the federal government where I have this clearly massive return on investment, but as, as a result of that, I get no reward from it, and I have to beg for my budget every year, uh, combined with this idea that um, much of the structure of our federal government in terms of research is very constrained or very uh, top-down and outcomes-focused, uh, which is a parallel universe to the way that most startups grow and evolve. Mm -hmm. right? Most startups are uh, constrained by resources at the beginning. Uh, many of them die quickly. Uh, failure's fine, so the people who are the founders go on and try something else again. And when an organization starts to work, it gets resources. And as more things happen, those resources compound. And one out of N, where N can be a very large number, become very significant and then have a lot of long-term impact over not a two or three year period of time, but 20 or 30 or 40 year period of time. I think the interesting thing is generationally understanding that and you get a spectrum, and you know, in this room there's a spectrum that probably spans three, at least three generations, maybe four generations. And making sure that we're not stuck in a paradigm collectively as a community that doesn't evolve generationally. Where, and I'll use CU as an example of this, that where I think CU is doing a good job here, and I'll use DeStefano as, as our chancellor in terms of his thought process. Um, uh, four years ago, you know, one of the things that CU Boulder is incredibly proud of is being a top 20 research institution in the United States. Well documented, well understood, works well in the context of university research and government dollars and recognition. Several years ago, the conversation started that around the idea of becoming a top 20 entrepreneurial university. Not in the context of necessarily spinning off companies but in the context of having a culture of entrepreneurship and a culture of innovation and getting contemporary uh, language and notions to bridge the university between the university research and uh, the community. And to become a top 20 research institution, I, I, the conversation that I had with, with Stefano was, it took Boulder 20 or 30 years to establish itself in a stable state of that. Right, it's always well regarded, but in terms of really being you know, high on that list and consistently there versus episodically there. And that same notion is important in terms of the broad culture. So I, I would just suggest, I think it's, it's useful for those of us, you know, I'm getting older, um, thinking about the next generation and the next generation in terms of getting that linked in and preserving the history, right? So that there's an arc through all of it versus what you see in places. I mean, Rochester's a great example. Buffalo is a great example. I mean, I was in Rochester a couple of years ago, and you know, Rochester was once a great place, and uh, I went to MIT, and the people at the Rochester Institute of Technology like to tell me that the first letter that the place I went to school was was wrong, and then they proceeded to tell me how, how dismal uh, <laughs> Rochester was, because they had you know, all these great students, and the very first thing the great students wanted to do when they graduated was get the hell out of there, because there was nothing to do. And you have to be careful not to end up in that place. Sure. So to that point, um, I think Boulder has, a, and picking up on where Jim left off with um, the group effort to get the university here, another example of a group effort, um, just regular citizens donating money and land in order to secure the university being here in 1876. But sort of like there are so many examples in Boulder's history of that kind of effort all related to the quality of life and thinking forward about what is going to make a good quality of life for this community. Another group effort was in 1908, um, a group called the Boulder City Improvement Association, not affiliated with the official city government, but a group of citizens raised money to bring Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. here to do some city planning. And he was the top landscape 
architect in the country. And so this little town of 10,000 people raise some money and bring this top level planner and he lays out um, what he thinks um, would be a wonderful plan for the beauty and the quality of life here. And that sort of goes on and on over the decades. And so then when you get someone like Walter or Roberts coming to Boulder with his wonderful wife, Janet, who lets him know, I'd prefer to stay in Boulder. Why does she prefer to stay in Boulder? Because we've sort of laid out this wonderful quality of life over the years. So you can't understate that. and. Um, you can't understate um, Janet Roberts being in Boulder, too, because she mm -hmm. had a huge influence in the city over those years. Let's loop in questions. We've got a tradition here at Silicon Flatirons that a student gets the first question, and a, uh, a curse of being in law school is the Socratic method may be in play if necessary. So is there a student that wants to, <laughs> to jump on that possibility? Is that Fletcher up there? All right, Fletcher, we'll loop you in. Yeah, you got you gotta come up with a good question here. Uh, well, it's just like, damn it, I'm not a student anymore. Yeah, <laughs> still roping me in. Uh, let's see. A good question. Um, how do you guys see Denver and the growth of Denver playing into like the, this the entire arc um, in the sense of like retaining talent? You guys see people leaving Boulder and going to Denver as the talent still being retained? Do you see Denver existing as a complementary support to Boulder? And before we answer, so uh, let's give the mic back. We'll get to the next question. And you guys, roll of Denver here. Well, I mean, I, I, increasingly, I see Denver and, and you know places down 36, the corridor, um, is is more and more becoming oddly, as it sounds, a, a kind of a bedroom community for Boulder because you have, you, well, you have. I mean, you see the, the. I mean, I've been, I've been a newspaper guy here for 27 years, and you know the the whole arguments of you know we don't we have we have more people coming into Boulder to work, you know we have we have more jobs and places to live, and you have this whole inflow and all this stuff. Um, you're really, I think, starting to see it more and more. But the Denver's becoming more expensive, so. You know, it's, it starts to not look as good, and so places like, you know, Decono and Frederick and places like that start to look, you know, better. But it's, it's. I think the quality of life issue is the big thing. I mean, you know, when you talk about, you know, spending money on, on, you know, making a decision, you, you say we're going to spend money and, and buy this land for this federal lab. Well, you know, in the same respect, the citizens of Boulder and Boulder County have been taxing themselves to buy open space for decades. And that is one of the biggest assets and attributes that make this place a really excellent place to live. And trust me, I've written and, and, and tried to tell people what an open space program is. And the last place that I finally convinced an editorial writer about it, he won the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, and convinced the Montgomery County commissioners to put in an open space program because they were losing tons of farmland outside of Philadelphia to this, these just sprawling, retarded developments. And, uh, and so, you know, what, we're, what we have here is really unique, and I know people know, think about it that way more now, but it's the same thing. We're, we're spending money to make our environment here better, whether it's putting in a federal lab that's non-toxic and going to, you know, boost our stature in the world, um, or just buying up land that you don't want to see strip malls on, as far as the eye can see, and that adds to the quality of life as well. Yeah, I would just add that, one of the largest problems I faced both at uh, NCAR and at NOAA was that I could not hire young people who could afford to live in Boulder. I'll just let that sink in. Brad, pretty different dynamic but in the startup communities between Boulder and Denver these days. I think, I think they're uh, uh, sim extra extraordinarily symbiotic. And when I moved here, you know, I heard I moved here 20 years ago. I heard over and over again, Boulder is 25 miles surrounded by reality. <laughs> I heard that you had to go through an airlock on 36, you know, either direction, and that you actually had to pass a uh, card if you wanted to come to Boulder from Denver. Uh, and you know, all that, all that, all that bullshit has sort of drifted away as uh, more and more people recognize that uh, the benefit of having a uh, 100,000 person town within 30 minutes of a uh, 2 million person town that's basically the gateway town to the western United States 
uh, is a really powerful linkage and both directions. And you see it in lots of different ways, including, I think Boulder is the fastest, or, or Denver is the fastest or second fastest growing city in the country right now in terms of people under the age of 30 moving there on a daily basis. Like, they can't move to Boulder because they can't afford it and there's no room. But at least they can move to Denver, which is close. And then you start to think about, again, this diversity, the density, the uh, inclusiveness, the more that Boulder and Denver can view themselves as sister cities, even with some gap between them and cultural differences in terms of the cities themselves. But sister cities in the context of innovation, startups, new technology, research, vibrant intellectual thing. Um, I have a ton of questions, um, but what role do incubators play here? What role do venture capitalists play here? And I want to springboard off your question because my other home location is Palo Alto. <laughs> and at 5 o'clock at night, I counted in a half an hour 23 buses taking employees from Google and the likes to San Francisco, not because they can't afford Palo Alto because they're making tons of money, because it's just as expensive in San Francisco. They want the culture of San Francisco. They want, they want all the young stuff, they want the theater, they want everything. And quite frankly, I don't see that culture as rich as it needs to be for those people. I thought you had a couple of ways to take really quickly. First of all, venture capitalists are totally irrelevant. Okay. And I think that's important to realize that uh, you know, VCs play a role in the ecosystem, but they're not the drivers of the ecosystem. And I think a lot of VCs, especially in the Bay Area, like to position themselves as the driver of the ecosystem, and they're, they're just wrong. Um, second, I, I know lots and lots of um, uh, entrepreneurs and employees of high growth companies all over the country. People have different things they want, and I'll use me as an example. I lived in Boston for 12 years, I had a company in Boston. The logical place for me to move would be the Bay Area. I don't want to live in the Bay Area. I don't want to live in a big city. I want to live in a town that's 100,000 or 200,000 people. So it's not that a young person who's in their, you know, 20s or 30s necessarily wants to live in the big city and that's the only thing. There is a chunk of people who want that. And then there's a chunk of people who are attracted to places like Boulder and there are people who are attracted to Austin, Texas and there are pe people that are attracted to, you know, go down the list. And I think the interesting thing and, and the vibrancy of a community is to have diversity of age and thinking um, and everything else, right? Diversity of gender, ethnic diversity, like those that, that collision is useful. I think one of the reasons why you actually see so many people in Mountain View getting in a bus and going to San Francisco, for any of you that spent any time in Mountain View, is that Mountain View is kind of a soulless part of the universe. <laughs> and, you know, really, you're not going from Palo Alto because you can't live in Palo Alto because it's too expensive and there's no housing in Palo Alto. Right, so it's it's there, there's different challenges everywhere. It's no different in New York City. Why does everybody want to live in Brooklyn all of a sudden? Right, these things will change over time. I think the really powerful thing about a community is to have a sense of itself and what itself is, and allow that to stay fresh over time. And I think Boulder, the 20 years that I've lived here, Boulder has done a good job of that. Like it's done a good job of being responsive and thoughtful, and you know balancing lots of different things, having some core principles like, you know, quality of life, like open space, like creative activity. I would suggest that most people that I know that come to Boulder are actually pretty blown away for a town of 100,000 people of the diversity of stuff they can run into here that's not just tech or mountain bike. So and that's powerful. I'm going to make a quick comment before Dale's question. One is that uh, your question is one part culture, one part infrastructure. A really interesting development over the last 10 years is the birth of the accelerator industry, which is infrastructure to support very early stage companies. 
And Boulder and Techstars more particularly pioneered a model by which volunteer mentors help these early stage companies. There's about 100 people in the network that make that happen. It's a really interesting version of collective action to help the next generation of companies that Boulder's played an important role in. And right now there's about eight accelerators out of Boulder um, around that see the November 6th conference upcoming. Um, another part of infrastructure I wanna, I'm gonna put Tom on the spot first is I have heard it asserted that by the time the internet boom hits in the 90s, and I think I've heard Brad say this among others, that there is sufficient and unique infrastructure here in terms of telecommunications because of the backbone of the federal labs. Any insight on that? And then I'd love to hear Brad talk a little bit about that before the next question. Tom? I think it's definitely true. Uh, Marla Meal, maybe you'd like to say something about that since Marla, uh, about the background that we had and how we could take advantage of the internet here. If we go back, though, to, say, 1992, 93, as the Internet is starting to get more and more traction, mm -hmm. were the labs uniquely wired and did Absolutely. that lay an infrastructure for the community? Let me tell you, starting a newspaper in Boulder, Colorado in 1996, and you having a T1 line come into, into the front of the Boulder Theater where you're putting out a weekly paper and you're sending out photos of, of you know, what turned into, like, the big media craziness of John, John Bonet murder and... and, uh, and that, it, it, it was so much different. I mean, we, being able to take advantage of that infrastructure the way we did as a small startup newspaper was huge. I mean, we, we crashed, we crashed, I don't know, New Hope had pretty robust servers. We put our newspaper up there um, and went, went on, um, we were, I was on the Today Show to talk about, you know, all the stuff that we'd broken news-wise that the Daily Camera hadn't. And so we had to kind of, that we're not we're a weekly paper but we're we act like a daily paper and and we had we, we went from zero to you know hundreds of thousands of hits a day um, and and it just kind of put us on the map because there was that infrastructure that was here because of the federal labs and it was and that was and that's I think going to be the case it's going to come back around um, right now we're working you know we've got this uh, this uh, the, 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 the first net and and the uh, communications technology lab and that's going to be you know that is that in itself is going to probably add another kind of layer of, of, of robustness to a communications network that I don't think anybody can really see where it could be heading you know where it will head but I think there's going to be a lot of, of uh, innovation coming out of that infrastructure as well I think there's two layers to this one is the technical layer which we were, were was ahead of the curve you know the, the commercial internet uh, really began in 1994, and so the wiring in Boulder was way ahead of the curve for many, many places. Um, but also the cultural <coughs> dynamics of the city and the type of people that were here in 1994 uh, also helped. So if you think about who <coughs> lived in Boulder in 1994, in addition to this very intense technology science base, uh, you know, we had in Boulder a whole bunch of people who were driving west in the 1960s and ran out of gas uh, <laughs> somewhere around here and decided that this was a nice place to just hang out. And uh, pot wasn't legal then, but it was probably pretty freely available in 1960, so you had to keep driving west. And so in the, in the 1990s, you had a, uh, a very uh, progressive, use whatever political language you want, progressive, liberal, I don't care, um, creative, 
free thinking, independent thinking community that was a pretty big part of the fabric of uh, Boulder. Arts, uh, creative, writing, um, people who marched to their own beat, people who were iconoclastic in terms of their own thinking. That is what the rise of the commercial internet embraced. I mean, if you think about the internet, anybody who was involved in companies between 1995 and 1999, it was truly crazy people building that first wave of companies because they saw this as a medium that allowed them to express themselves in a way that previously they had to use, you know, they were constrained by some type of industrial phenomena, whether it was... You had to make something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> had, It wasn't just like, oh, a page Here on, I am. on my, on my right. monitor. And so, so Boulder, Boulder was pretty uh, purpose-built in terms of the thinking, and it wasn't, if it was just the creative side of it, it would have been a mess. But it was the creative side of it with this strong, technical, scientific underpinning and background and the ability of those people to get together generated a whole bunch of really interesting uh, companies um, and things around uh, that first wave, which I think has served us well over the last 20 years. So I, I won't ask him about the prevalence of weed in the 60s here, but Dale Hatfield's had a <laughs> uh, first person perspective on the Boulder arc, both at the intersection of the labs as well as the university and the startup scene. Dale? Uh, first, uh, I should probably say I'm speaking strictly as a private uh, private citizen. <laughs> uh, Is this the part about weed now? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. That's your uh, limitation. Uh, He's way uh, gone. Uh, James, I had my question is is for you. Your your presentation spoke of the NIST Boulder Labs and uh, what you just talked about the NIST Boulder Labs, and uh, actually, of course, there's NTIA and also NOAA, which is here, that's part of that. In fact, they're in some sense, they're all equal. And I was just curious as to why you used NIST so much as emphasizing NIST as opposed to those other organizations. Uh, my Primarily because I know NIST best, and that's, you know, I, not, 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 nothing against NTIA or, or, or NOAA, but I mean, those, those organizations in, in one way or another kind of came out of research at NIST that grew to a point where they needed their own their own place to to you know kind of nurture be nurtured and, and to grow. I don't interpret the history that way, but we can mm -hmm. okay. take it offline. I think a lot of the originals came from the radio side. Right. I mean the the you know NOAA and the up looking Doppler radar was was one element of, of kind of that radio research that grew. Um, and became a huge tool for weather forecasting and, and looking at atmospheric, you know, air movements and things. And, and, you know, when that became more and more measuring the atmosphere, measuring the environment, you know, that element of it, NOAA seemed to fit, a or at least a model of a NOAA seemed to fit something better, and that would grow that way. But I mean, I don't, I don't, dis I don't discount NTIA or, or, you know, NOAA at all, because, I mean, they're a huge piece of, of you know, our campus and, um, you know, I just know I just know NIST better, and so I, I I kind of want to talk about what I know and not be wrong. Uh, if I could just add one sure. quick comment, uh, we haven't brought up the fact that in these years Boulder was dry, and Denver played a very very important role. If you were here, because the most you could get was three two beer, so. If you wanted something for dinner other than three two beer, you had to go out just outside the city, or you would drive to drive to dinner. So, so it wasn't go to quite the red the lion, pot, wasn't <laughs> quite, or the red lion, or the red lion, several yeah, others. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So seven o'clock is our stop time. Let me implore a couple things. First of all, uh, lots of the people who have hands in the air are some of the most interesting people in town. Uh, we've got a reception next, and I really encourage you to take advantage of that. I think there's going to be some fascinating follow-up discussion. Second is Silicon Flatirons will send out a survey. If you think this worked, I'd like to hear it or not. One idea is that we do a history crash course every year on a different topic. And if you've got a suggestion of next year's topic, I've certainly got some ideas in mind. But I think this is a really interesting concept. It's almost antithetical to entrepreneurs to look backwards sometimes. Uh, but it's so healthy and such an interesting part. Please help me give a warm thank you to this palace. Thank you.
Let me, let me put one little plug. Um, next year, a year from now, um, I did this last year, and then the idea got taken from me and executed back in our headquarters in Gaithersburg. But I did a NIST, a NIST technology showcase, and it was kind of a you know all you could eat technology buffet on what we do at NIST. Little ten minute snippets of presentations from our researchers, ability to go and follow up with them, and then lab tours, which are very cool. Um, if you're interested, I'll, I can pass that information along to you folks because we'd like, my intent is to open it to the public. The more people see what we do, the more ideas come of, of applications of technologies that are mind-blowing going on at work. Yeah.